Hello there, and welcome to Success as a Student, a skills podcast for students and anyone who wants to develop key skills that will help them in being successful. My name is Alexander Wood. I create online skills content for the University of Derby. Outside of work, I'm a trustee, a chairperson of a youth group, and the University of Derby Graduate of the Year. In this series, we focus on how you can develop skills that will help you to succeed in your university study, your career, and in your personal development, all by interviewing experienced University of Derby staff and successful students. In today's episode, we're discussing how you can develop skills that will help you to be enterprising. An enterprising person is someone who can make opportunities for themselves and create and execute innovative ideas and projects. These enterprise skills are skills that are highly sought after by employers and are really useful for students looking to start their own business and those who are looking to work on new and exciting projects. So to help me explore the area of enterprise, today I will be interviewing the university's enterprise manager, Oliver Stonia, to discuss and outline what these enterprise skills are and how you can develop them. Hello, Oliver. Thank you very much for joining me on this podcast today. Uh, Before we start, would you like to briefly introduce yourself to the viewers? Yeah, delighted to. My name's Oliver Stonia. I'm the Enterprise Manager at the University of Derby based in the careers team. So usually I sit in the Enterprise office at Kedleston Road, um, the main campus. In terms of my background and what got me into this kind of role, is that I was a former Derby University student myself, which a lot of people don't know. Um, I studied law, I did a law degree. I did not know what I wanted to achieve, become. I didn't have an aim in terms of my career. I just had, let's say, good grades at high school and college and thought, what am I supposed to do? What's a good topic to take? So I chose law because you can move into a lot of fields as a result of that. And then from there, I ended up joining a temping agency and started working in uh, the local college, Derby College. And as, as I moved through working in that college, I ended up taking over and becoming the manager of enterprise, the manager of work experience, international business, and the Erasmus project. So I've had a a varied background, sampled a lot of different types of business. One of the types of business that I learned the most from was the international business, which is where I personally think I developed most of my enterprise skills in that I was physically based in Derby in an office and I was tasked with making millions of pounds worth of sales from my office. Um, and had to think of clever and how I would term it enterprising ways of making those millions of pounds from my desk without any money to go and find and sell to people. So um, that started my journey. Um, I've helped people start up businesses for about three years and now I've started at the university. It's been one year that I've been here continuing that and that's been my most enjoyable job role so far what I'm doing now which is coaching people mentoring people day to day with their business ideas and it's just exciting to see the types of things that people are working on and could be coming to us in the future. It sounds great like a great varied background I think we've got quite a bit in common there in first of all the sense that both of us are law graduates from the University of Derby Um, and from additionally to that um, you were talking about how you had to make a lot of, you had to make things happen with no budget or anything. Mm. That's something that I consider to be very enterprising because that's what I've always had to do and I love doing that. But what would you say enterprising skills are? That's the hot topic question at the moment, if I'm honest, in that it's something that I think everybody needs to know about and that there's a fault potentially in the education system in that enterprising skills essentially are the skills required for people to notice gaps, notice where change could improve a service or a product, notice where speed of producing something would help, making a product 
cheaper than it currently is, anything that can make a business better than it currently is, or a service better than it currently is in some way more useful to the consumer, whatever it might be, is enterprising. And therefore, every business in the entire world requires people with enterprise skills. Nobody in the UK education system teaches enterprise skills really properly until they get to university. In terms of answering the actual what are enterprise skills, people often categorize them as things like being creative, creative meaning um, spotting gaps, creating a new product, creating a new um, service, creating a new potential policy that makes something change inside an organization. So creativity tends to be the obvious one that people link with enterprise, but really enterprising skills are endless. Every skill in the country for any job is an enterprising skill. And that being said, networking to me is the actual most important Mm. one. If you know how to physically network with people, then businesses will value you. If you can reproduce physical networking in a digital environment, therefore use social um, social media platforms to network, then that's a whole new way that businesses can use your skills and will find you useful to their business. So in terms of the most important in this day and age with COVID and so on right now, networking via social media and networking in the future personally to turn that into sales or business opportunities or sharing of best practice is one of the most important skills that a lot of people today let I won't say are not very good at but they don't understand that it's not a skill you're born with it's a bit like a sport you should train in it like you would to swim you don't automatically know how to swim when a mother throws a baby into the swimming pool, they're not going to swim immediately. But if you keep going in the pool and trying and practicing, eventually you can and you're good at it. Some people might, yes, naturally end up being better at it. But um, that in terms of enterprise skills, I think is where we sit at the moment. You've got networking skills, creativity skills, you've got time management skills, You've got loan working skills because a lot of the time people who, in terms of enterprise for starting new businesses, um, usually when you start a new business, there's a lot of loan working involved at the beginning part. In the future, yes, you might employ more people and therefore you've got a team. But to begin with, loan working is something that people um, should experience and get better at. So I think in terms of the major ones, yeah. I would start with those. So you've hinted at quite a few things that I'd like to talk to you about and get some advice from you on, particularly networking and also uh, how students can develop uh, these enterprise skills, such as creativity and such. But I think I agree with you in how important enterprise is. And you were talking just a minute ago about how it's useful for when you are starting up something or a project and you're doing it on your own. Mm-hmm. So something that I consider with an enterprise as a whole is the ability to, when you're starting, hustle a little bit and do all the jobs that are required on your own to an extent and develop a lot of a broad range of skills. Would you agree with that? Yes, you guys listening have all of the skills to be enterprising and to be of benefit to any company you want to move into in the future. You just need to practice at them. And so at the moment, we're devising a new what we hopefully will call an enterprise ecosystem Mm -hmm. in that we have a startup enterprise program in Be The Boss that sits in the careers team, which is for people who either definitely know they want to start a business and therefore they join it and it it teaches them and it shows them and gives them the platform to create a business plan and register the business and start. But we also need to give students and graduates time to think about enterprising skills and then to explore them. So we're looking at if there can be gaps in timetables allocated for enterprise so that people genuinely can allocate some time to go and research the skills, practice the skills in various other opportunities. We're looking at 
what we call dirty workspaces and clean workspaces so that people in creative arts can, and not necessarily people in creative arts, people, for example, from the business school who have a creative idea that I, I have a couple of these students in the Be The Boss program. They're business students who have a, a clothing brand idea, but they don't have the clothing brand skills. So in the future, they'll be able to move into the Banks' mill studios and take up one of the dirty workspaces and either learn the skill or network with other students who already have the skill and bring them into their business. And so we're planning on that being accessible across the whole of the university in whichever sector that anybody's in. So whether that's mm. dirty workspaces in engineering, health and social care, whatever it might be, there'll be a platform for that. We're also encouraging social enterprise in that a lot of people see volunteering as just volunteering, but we have volunteering opportunities that develop enterprise skills. And one of which is the Enactus program at the university, which is essentially um, a social enterprise that's been set up by our own students. So they've decided that they want to try and fix an issue that's going on in our local society. So they've built their own volunteering opportunity by starting up this Enactus company and then recruiting more students who will now see the opportunity and want to tackle it. They will work with them on it and they they've actually won a couple of competitions along the way. Um, so that. by showcasing all of these things and giving students and graduates the opportunities to go and have a go at all of these things, we will create enterprising students and graduates. Mm. I think the university is just the perfect place to gain enterprise skills. There's such a large network of people available to help you and almost categorised by skill at times. I know that um, I was a lawyer graduate as well, and a lot of the time when I got my experiences was through the programs that were there so i had the ability to create a society um to get involved in volunteering when i saw those new volunteering opportunities that i had the ability to take i decided i'll make my own and mm -hmm. i worked with people who supported me to do that and often that can be the best way of getting experience but if you have an idea something that i did and one of the people that i'm interviewing later in the series about boldness is someone i think you know oliver called sue jennings i came to her with an idea that i had and i said can i uh, I've got this idea. Can you help? Can I do it? It was an idea about doing in-class teaching from students to students. It was very similar to the peer-assisted learning scheme, uh, but with their own little twist on it, our own little enterprising idea, some creative thinking behind it to enhance it. And we did it. And it's helped me get to where I am now. And that was because the university is this amazing place where you can, if you have ideas, go to people and ask for support and they will back you and help you. Um, so if I'm a student and I have an idea that is interesting or enterprising, what should I do with that idea? Hmm. It's a perfect question to ask, if, to be honest. And the perfect example for any student is what you've just said in that you've gone, you've come up with an idea and you've tried to see if it will work and luckily you've been backed and it has worked and you've learned from it. I think the most important thing to take from it is that nothing, no idea, even if it fails, was a bad idea mm -hmm. because from the idea failing, you will have learned why it failed and what made it fail. So I think a lot of people are scared to talk about those experiences in their potential interviews with employers or when they're looking to try and maybe win funding from a bank for a new business idea. They want to potentially hide the fact that something they did previously failed. But actually, that is what people want to hear. They want to hear that you tried something and that you learned something from it, whether it was good or bad. You learn this happened and therefore I'm not going to do that again. I'm going I know that I'm going to tweak this part and this part so that it will be successful. And you only really learn when you get feedback or when things go wrong. When things are going right all the time, you, there's not a lot to learn there. So it might be good and it might be nice at the time, but you actually learn more when things don't go so well. So I would just say if people have ideas, 
approach anyone you can possibly approach at university. We're always open in the careers department ourselves for those kind of opportunities. So we're here to help but your fellow academics and all the other support services in CSL. Mm-hmm. Um, go and approach them. And I'm sure that you'll be backed because that's what, as you said earlier, that's what a university is supposed to be about. It's a learning experience. You're not just here, as I thought when I was a law student, to simply come and study the program that someone's written. And then once I've achieved or not achieved, I leave. They are supposed to be multiples of buildings where you should go and interact with the people inside them, experience everything you can possibly experience, have as many failures as you can possibly have whilst you're at university, because then when you come out, you will have a great track record to put in front of people and say, look how much I learned whilst I was here. Now I've got no mistakes to make because I've had a go at everything. I, I love it. I love the idea of being free to fail and almost, I wouldn't say aim to fail, but try things that have a chance of failing because you learn mm. from them. I was talking to um, Fiona Shelton about uh, freedom to fail and growth mindset and how having this mindset of trying things, even if there's a risk, is a great skill. So that's another episode of this podcast that you can check out. But uh, you were speaking then about how your mindset when you were a student was... Uh, that you're here studying that's exactly what my mindset was when I started it was only later on when I was in, later in my year to go my second year that I realized that if I wanted to get where I wanted to get I had to have experience and part of that is because of Sue Jennings uh, coming into the university and being bold and saying if you want to really stand out here's what you can do in creating a culture we are an accepting environment where you can make um, changes and come up with ideas Something that I just would like to note, though, is that idea that I came to Sue Jennings with, it totally changed. When I initially had this idea, it was nowhere near as good as it was when it finished. Yeah. The same with this series and the same with a lot of my, the ideas that anyone has. When you start, you've got the fragments and you develop and build it. Uh, what would you say about that in terms of ideas and then building up? That's, that's, as I said earlier, that's my favourite part of the Be The Boss support service, mm-hmm. that the first part of the program once somebody registers for it is that they have to meet me on a one-to-one and I go through um, what the support offer is in total in that it's got 10 pre-recorded workshops, one-to-ones with me, one-to-ones with external business consultants, the potential to join a pitching competition at the end to win money or funding towards their business idea. But the first point, as I said, is the most important for me where I listen to the individual in terms of what they think of enterprise why they've booked this appointment with me why they've joined be the boss do they just want to learn enterprise skills and do we want to come up with a let's call it a fake or a pretend company to go through the process with so they can learn um, what it takes to start a business and to learn enterprise skills But more importantly, the other side, the students that do come and graduates with a business idea, I get to hear the the acorn of the idea. And by one, sometimes two hours later, because we have fun chatting about these things, the idea is usually fully changed by the time we finished our meeting and they've got 10 million new avenues that they need to and want to go and explore. And by the end of a sometimes two week, sometimes one year process of going through Be The Boss, it's totally up to the individual. Um, they, they've, they've produced a company that, although it has the initial ethos of what they thought, is now tackling lots of different issues. And one of my the most important focuses I put into every business now, or I try to with every student and graduate, is... The fact that the best businesses in the world have a social element to them. So whereas previously, lots of businesses were simply, we have this product, we know you want it, so you need to, you will pay for this product off us, you will buy this product for five, ten pound, whatever it might be, and that's the end of our transaction. And that's fine at the time whilst somebody wants to come and buy the product, but when the competitor comes along with a slightly better product or a cheaper product, there's nothing to hold your customers to you anymore. So I try and bring into every new business the fact that you can sell your 
product if that's what you've come up with but the more you can link it to some sort of social impact so giving some of your profits to a certain charity or for every five items that someone buys you're going to grow another animal in the local farm somehow whatever you can do to link it to a social impact locally or nationally will give you so much future impact in your business that's not even quantifiable with customers staying with you because they actually value the social impact but you as a person and a business owner knowing that you're making a social impact as well as your own money to live off um, has got a power that I think all entrepreneurs ultimately want to achieve the feeling that they're doing something good and they're not just making money for themselves or others. Yeah, I do like the idea that there is a positive benefit from what you do. And a lot of it comes down to creativity in the sense that you are helping the world, but in a way that creatively also boosts your enterprise and your whatever you, you are working on or towards. So, so far, we've been talking quite a bit about businesses, but earlier on, when I asked you to define enterprise skills, you mentioned how employers look for enterprise skills. So how is enterprise skills relevant to when you work for a company rather than run your own company? Okay, so let's just think of it in terms of the Be The Boss program for someone joining it who has a business idea. The process in its simplest form is, we will show them how to complete a business plan from start to finish. In that business plan, they're going to need to consider who their target market is, who their customers are. They're going to need to consider their strengths and weaknesses in a SWOT analysis. They're going to need to consider the finances and accounting of that. They're going to need to consider where they might base their their factory or their shop or whatever it might be they're going to need to consider all of those things and they're going to potentially need to consider someone might need to invest in them at the beginning to get it all going therefore they're going to need to pitch whether that's a real idea or a fake idea from someone who is simply joining it to learn enterprise skills you can see straight off the bat that if i'm showing Um, a student starting a business, how to use social media to sell their product or get their name out there, that same skill could be useful for someone who's going to work for an IT company and that IT company is struggling for sales and needs a new way of selling, they're going to be able to transfer that digital skill of social media sales and networking. If you're talking about networking, every business needs networking. So if you've proved that you can develop a network of followers to your business or network on LinkedIn because of your social impact idea, you will be able to develop a network inside a business if they give you a target audience that they want you to try and create. And the easiest to show people is the the final point of be the boss which is the pitching competition where you come and pitch a business idea and just on the off chance that any student listening that doesn't want to join be the boss they still can join the pitching competition if they have a business idea you can just simply come and pitch the idea because um, we wanted to make it open to as many people as possible because if you think of pitching it's practically the same as presenting and that's practically the same as interviewing and every job needs you to be interviewed before they will give you the job so if you're good at pitching a business and therefore telling a story about where your business came from and you're comfortable with that and you're comfortable with either doing it in person or remotely and you know the type of story that people are expecting to hear in a pitch it will automatically mean that you're good at also pitching yourself in front of employers who are judging you for a job role Um, and we have loads of interesting tips on pitching slash presenting slash interviewing which all link into the things we're talking about my best example in terms of interviewing being if you get any interaction with the employer that you're about to get a job interview with you will see you'll probably get an email from an administrator of some sort telling you when your interview is you'll see her name and contact info on there you might have 
seen the job advert come out and it might say something on the job advert like contact such and such a person for more information about the job role. Now, for me, in terms of anyone who's been through the Be The Boss program, I would have taught them that anybody you ever meet in life, you should add on LinkedIn at that moment. <laughs> as simple as that. So when that kind of thing happens, when you're looking for a job, I would have added the administrator on LinkedIn. I would have searched for the person who it said, if you want more information about on LinkedIn, I would find out what their interests are in mm -hmm. LinkedIn. So that when I come for the interview, as I walk into the room, I can be saying, oh, I saw on LinkedIn that you're interested in such and such. And that's one of my passions too. And you just create that one bit of difference between you and the other applicants for the job role. And that would be natural to people that have joined Be The Boss because I'm so passionate about networking and LinkedIn. And so I wouldn't ever miss a trick for anyone in terms of anyone you meet, get them on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. It's such a powerful tool is LinkedIn uh, for students. And just because even if you try and add someone, like you said about adding the admin person, if they say no, well, you're in the same position as you were before. Yeah. If they say yes, they'll see your post in the future. So if you post about things or you see what they're, what's going on in their business, uh, you see their post and you interact with them, it might help you get an advantage. And a lot of what I heard about interviews and job going for jobs, is it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. Yeah. And that's that's the power of social media. But as you've said, in particular in LinkedIn, and that's something that I spotted in terms of LinkedIn about 12 years ago or 10 years ago, whenever it was when I was in international business. And I, as we said earlier, had no money to go and find new international business. So I used LinkedIn and I found people with job titles of such who would have, let's say, budget to hold that potentially might buy our product. I contacted them through LinkedIn. I found agents that were doing the types of work I needed on LinkedIn, and that's the platform I used. And as you were allu alluding to earlier, if, for example, you connect with the administrator and they accept you, they become a first connection. But that means that the second and third connections of that administrator might see the posts that you post yeah. simply because of the way that LinkedIn works and it's called its organic reach. I'd highly recommend it for any student as well. I um, I know when I first got it, it looked a little bit intimidating, but I went to a, one of the workshops done by the Career Service at the time. So that was when I was, that was, I think that was before you joined the university because I was in my second year at that point. And I was just so surprised by the end of the second year how well it worked. I met a staff member at the start of second year just after I got LinkedIn. First thing he did, I added him on LinkedIn after I met him. Um, and I kept seeing that staff member. I saw him about three times across the year. And by the end of the year, he said, oh, you're doing really well, Alex. And I was like, well, how do you know I'm doing well? <laughs> but just because I posted what I've been doing on LinkedIn and that person yeah. had seen it. And it shocked me. And that person, I'm not going to name them, but they... All of a sudden, we noticed how well each other were doing, what we were doing outside, and it's a really good way to project yourself onto the outside world. So definitely do get do get involved in LinkedIn. If you need any help, I'd highly recommend going to the careers service. I don't know if you've got any additional information you'd like to promote with that, but it definitely helped me get get started with it. Yeah, it's it's a service that the careers service offers. It's something that we really value um, and encourage students to get involved with. We have LinkedIn workshops. Um, that specifically target that skill um, but as with most things you won't learn much about it unless you just have a go mm. if you go and register yourself a profile if you're worried about it don't put your picture on don't put um, too many contact details on and just start adding people that you know and see what happens from it I'm sure it won't take you long to start seeing the benefits and thinking oh, I can easily see how I can use LinkedIn to move forward um, but essentially in the future I would be suggesting every student from the same college should be linked together on LinkedIn yeah, I just I still can't care for how great it was and how beneficial it is. I don't actually know if it helped me at all, but it definitely helped me get my profile out there. If you're doing anything worth shouting about, definitely put it on there because people will find it. And I find people going onto my LinkedIn profile. I saw six people view it today. I've not posted on it in a few months because of what I've been doing. Uh, but do go on it and shout about what you do. So we've talked about a lot about what enterprise is. And we've talked about how students can help with their networking uh, through LinkedIn. 
Do you have any advice for how students can be enterprising? Yeah, they can go and find as much data as they're interested in is the best bit of advice I could give. Data will shape the future and their future and our future. So going to whichever networks you can get into that can expose you to as much good quality data as possible is what you should be doing with your time. So that as a start point, exposing yourself to data, whether that's from your academics, your lecturers, the things they give you, whether it's in your personal life, whether you follow certain websites that give you information, whether you follow the government websites and so on, getting the data of what's going on in your sector or the sectors you're interested in is where you should start trying to develop ideas and look at what could be enterprising. Then I would say networking, go and network with fellow people on your course, people that are not on your course, go and find out who they are, what they're studying, what data they've been shown and tell them what data you've been shown and you'll probably come up with something together and then go and, as you said, get involved in something you don't usually get involved with in like you said with your with your social impact volunteering opportunity there's multiple opportunities like that at the university there's the futures award there's the volunteering opportunities with the careers team but also there is the enactus that i talked about earlier project where the students run their own social enterprise activities um, and if you're a student who has a personal passion, joining Enactus means you can try and drive the Enactus team to go and tackle an issue that you're personally passionate about. So that's a nice opportunity in itself. Um, you can join the Be The Boss program and either start up a business idea or run through the motions of um, a pretend business idea to try and develop the enterprise skills. You could simply join the pitching competition and try and see what it's like to sell a business idea, even if you're not genuinely thinking that you're going to start that business idea. There should be nothing holding you back from just joining the competition and trying to pitch it. And if you if you don't succeed, you've lost nothing. If you do succeed, you win a thousand pounds. But either way, you're going to see what it feels like to try and sell a business idea to five people you've never met before mm. and listen to the types of questions that they're going to come at you with based on your business idea. You're going to potentially use the skills I mentioned earlier in terms of researching the judge on the panel via LinkedIn, so or judges on the panel via LinkedIn, so you can see what your mutual interests are. So there's an absolute plethora of ways that you can try and be enterprising, Absolutely. join into the enterprise ecosystem, but not least, simply following the careers LinkedIn page or my LinkedIn page as a start point or the Be The Boss Instagram page and Facebook page will give people opportunities that they will see and potentially want to have a go at. We're trying to not come up with opportunities that we think are good and pushing them on to the students and graduates. I'm hoping that moving forward, we start engaging with students and graduates and asking them for the type of opportunity they'd be comfortable with doing. So yes, a lot of it is about taking the opportunities that are available for you to help you to make your own opportunities in the future because there's lots of support available. Other things that I think would also be helpful in terms of the other people that could help. Um, with societies, I definitely learned a lot from being involved in a society, especially when you come to leading that society, you can make enterprising decisions and help with influencing that uh, that if you get involved on the committee of a society a lot of what you were talking about those people who tend to be most sex successful i think one of the reasons that i think of when i think of why is because they've learned to hustle but also to do multiple things at once and to spin many plates and to not just say okay this is what i'm good at but having to develop the things that they're not so good at so that they get to a level that actually i can do this and that's one of the ways to get something started. So I know with this series that I'm running at the moment, I can't. I I'm not very good at graphics, but for the season, the first series of podcasts that I did, I designed them all myself. I self-taught and had to do that because there was no one else for that. This year, we've got Stephen Plant, who's amazing at making graphics because of the success of the first season. 
But if we hadn't have been bold and tried to get that going, we would never have that. So sometimes you've got to try and do things, even if you're not comfortable with doing the, that skill, try and develop it to a basic level, do it, make it to a level that's doable, and then show that you've got a concept that can be developed and then people might be able to want to invest in that. And I think you can't put a price on that piece of knowledge there. That takes me right back to my first day at Dot University as a student in the law class. I'm assuming they changed, they might have changed their methodology by the time you came. It was much later. But the first day I arrived in class, we were told to stand up one by one in the law lecture <laughs> theatre that could hold 150, 180 people. And they said, one by one, you need to stand up in front of everyone, introduce yourself and tell your most embarrassing fact. And we had to do that. No choice because you're put on the spot and you didn't know that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I'd ever been asked to talk in front of people that I didn't know. Well, I'd never been asked to do that at college, school, you weren't, it wasn't planned for, so that was different. And so as a result of that, forcing me to talk in front of people, the next time I then got asked to talk in front of people, that was probably not again in university, if I'm honest, it was when I was in work, I at least knew in the back of my mind, well, I have done it once before, mm. so... I'll say yes, and I'll, and it's not going to be worse than that time. So then I did it again, and it wasn't worse. So then I did it another time, and then I started to get comfortable with it, and then it grew from there, and that's like what you're saying. Once you've had a go and you've experienced the worst, the worst thing that could happen to anyone is that they're going to die on the spot. Chances are that's not going to happen. So it's not going to be that bad. So just put yourself into the opportunity experience the worst and then it will always get better from there and you will reap the rewards in the future yeah um i totally agree what we had is something slightly different which helped me to form my mindset which was uh, we had to stand up and they basically told almost everyone to sit down they, i think they said stand up look around you look how many people there, there are and they told 12 of us to sit down and said that's about how many people in this room will get jobs in law you've got to make <laughs> yourself stand out that's what they said and in my first year, I was like, yeah, I'm going to stand up by getting great grades. And then I spoke to employees and they said, uh, okay, well, you know, you might have won an award or whatever, but that's not what we're looking for. We don't care about if you know things, you need to be practical. And I was like, oh, okay, let's get some practical skills. That was my attitude. So I tried to uh, use that. And I think that mindset of you've got to make yourself employable and stand out, especially now, is crucial. Just thinking about what you said, though, about public speaking, a lot of enterprise skills, especially networking, um, a lot of them are things that people get nervous doing. Do you have any advice for someone who says, well, I feel nervous doing this type of enterprise skill? The first bit being, I was one. I was one before university. I was shy. I wouldn't have wanted to speak to anybody. Like I just said, it's amazing what that one experience can do in the first lecture at Derby University for the lecturer to do that, put me out of my comfort zone where I had no choice and no time to react. I was at the back of the classroom, so I couldn't even run out of the classroom if I'd have wanted to. So I just did it and it was actually not that bad. So the first bit being have a go no matter what. Second bit being I've had a, a student with high anxiety that's come into my office when we were pre-COVID and, and asked this exact question. And I have loads of mini techniques that I like to give to people based on my experiences being um, whatever makes you comfortable at the time. So I talk about things like usually in a one to one conversation, you would look at someone directly in their eyes or at least in their face. Um, and you're comfortable with that because it's one to one. So I say when people are watching you present and therefore there's more than one person all looking at you what they're really they're all looking at your face and you can't look at all of their faces at the same time because it's impossible so actually none of them are looking at you in your face because they're not hoping to see you look directly back at them because they know it's not a one-to-one -one conversation so as a start point 
you don't need to feel like you are having a one-to-one conversation with everyone and therefore addressing everyone on a one-to-one basis. Therefore, you don't need to look at every single person at the time. So I give people the tip of finding one reference point in the room that's usually in the center above the middle middle person that's in in the room that you're looking at slightly above their head so you're not looking at their eyes and making them feel uncomfortable and therefore you're not actually looking at anyone you're just looking towards the middle of the group and slightly above the group but they can't tell they think that you're looking at them then that takes away the pressure off your own shoulders that you're being watched intensely because you've got nobody's eyes particularly on you because you can't see them second it's not in an annoying way but to there's no harm taking something with you that nobody notices whether i always use the example of the parker pen that's got the little top that you can click in and click out but i know people take those my child has one of those anxiety block cubes things that he can click things on or roll things. No one would notice if you're holding your pad or your script or whatever it is that someone's given you to read off if you had the little clicker anxiety device, whatever it might be, that you can click every now and again to yourself when you're feeling a bit panicked. No one will notice that. No one will comment on that. Everyone in the audience already appreciates how nerve-wracking it is for someone to stand up in front so there no one's there to try and make you feel awkward in the main let's say Mm -hmm. so that would be another thing i would also say one of the most important things is to breathe and i know people say yeah breathing techniques is something you should use and something that quite often when you get put into the panicky situation it's the thing that you forget about immediately in that you start rushing your words you start speaking really fast and you forget to breathe and i tell everyone to just sometimes pause look at the audience ask someone something back so it doesn't feel like you're lecturing them and so you do have the opportunity to say things like even when you're just trying to catch up with your own thoughts and you might have forgotten something use the use the whole platform to your advantage and just say did you understand my last point ask that to the crowd Mm -hmm. give yourself five minutes to just then listen to what they're saying but really you're actually thinking what was i supposed to say next because i'd forgotten it gives you a little bit of time to catch up with what's going on in front of you so there's lots of techniques for public speaking but the main one being going to have a go in the first instance and if you can't speak no one's going to boo you off stage for not speaking you you will leave and then you'll go and talk to whoever was set up the event afterwards and you'll explain why they'll understand why and they'll probably give you some tips on how to do it better next time you no, no one's going to do anything bad to you as a result of you not being able to speak at the time i do a lot of public speaking again and it's true that i get very nervous before i get nervous before my classes i get nervous before my interviews i get nervous before i start networking and the truth is i think a lot of people do and the crucial thing is if you try and do it once and then just think a little bit bit like what you said oliver um you've done it before and just motivate use that to push yourself and the more you practice doing something, the more comfortable that thing you get. So what do you think about that? I think it's spot on and it's I'm one who advocates, I think, for being rational and rationalizing as much as you possibly can. And if you really analyze your life and your experiences and you think about it, you probably will come to the conclusion that the scariest bits that happen aren't the ones that are to do with education or work they're usually to do with health so you being asked or you wanting to go and do a public speaker talk should be when you look at it rationally the consequence of you not doing so well in it if that's what happens is not really a consequence compared to the other things in life so you wouldn't not go to a medical appointment if somebody was telling you that something was bad so don't not go to a public speaking event because someone's told you that it could be bad 
it's just definitely an opportunity um, to try and do those things. And I just would try, even if it makes you nervous, because it gets you out there, helps you build all that network uh, by getting involved and taking opportunities. If you're public speaking, if anyone invites you to anything, it can be good. Even, like you said earlier, even if you do make mistakes, you can learn from them. And so we talked about networking in terms of social media earlier. Do you have any advice for networking in person? Hmm. <clears throat> networking in person, <laughs> obviously we can't do it very much at the moment. Not the moment. Uh, when, when we can, um, much the same as presenting <clears throat> in the, or pitching or public speaking, people are nervous because they ha- like the swimming skill it's something that you get better at by trying it and doing it again and again and again, and you just get better and better and better. And some people are naturally good at it, but can get better. And some people need to go to lots of them and try and do it lots of times before they even get slightly good. So tips and things that I learned along the way on that is, as we've said with public speaking, the first time I was asked to go to a networking event, which didn't happen at university, it happened in my job role later. <clears throat> I didn't know what happened at those mm. things. I didn't know exactly what you were supposed to do, but I just went along to see what happened. So I went and I didn't know anybody because mm-hmm. it was my first one. So how was I supposed to know anybody? Everybody else knew everybody else. So they were all talking with each other because that's what happens at those events and you're new. So you kind of, as people have always say in these situations, you're kind of sat on your own thinking, is someone going to come and talk to me? The first time, no one might talk to you, but you experience what the networking event was like. You understood that, okay, people know each other. So they're all speaking to each other. They go and have a bite to eat. They go and grab a drink. And then maybe there's a specialist speaker who comes on to talk. So that's what genuinely tends to happen. Next time I go to the networking event, I think, right, I'm going to try and purposely talk to at least one person. (laughs) So we'll go to the next one. And I didn't have to do anything at the next one. The next time, maybe it was different people or whatever, but somebody approached me and started talking to me. So I didn't even have to put any effort in. And I've talked, I've hit my personal goal of talking to one person. And then I might have talked to multiple other people from that one, went to the next one. And now you've heard how the first person, how the first person approached me by saying, Hi, my name's such and such from such and such a company. Um, isn't the aren't the sandwiches great? And I was thinking, that's a good easy way to get in to talk to people you don't know. That's something I'll do on my next go. So the next time I use the same line. And then you hear the way other people come and try and start conversations with you. And so you just learn the types of things that fly in those meetings and you start using yeah. them yourself and putting your own tweaks on them and it get, goes from strength to strength and then by the end of it you realize that networking events are the best events you could possibly go to and they're actually the most fun events that a business could possibly send you to it's a chance to go and have a chat with people that like the same subject that you like and have usually some free food and drink to yeah. go along with it so why wouldn't you want to go I know as a student, I first of all went for the free food. Um, But after that, I struggled just in the same ways as you did with networking events in person. And I just didn't know what to say. Like, what do you say to these people? Other than, can you give me a job, please? Please, (laughs) experience, work experience, hi. And yeah, after a while, you start getting better. And I always thought I was tired about networking. But then I went to a networking event with all my friends who hadn't been to networking events before. And I was like, yeah, I'm not very good. Oh, good people over here. I'm just going to speak to them, see what happens, join in the conversation. And they, I came back afterwards to them and they were like, you're amazing. And I'm like, no, I'm not. But it's, obje- it's subjective how good you are at these things. And the more you go and the more practice you become, the more you realize you actually get better. And some, a tip that I would give is um, read the news before you go, even if you just read the headlines. Yeah. Uh, as you said earlier, look at people who are definitely going, look at their LinkedIn profile, see what they're interested in because you can connect to them, realise, oh, I like this too. And you might be able to connect to them on that on that ground. Um, and add, yeah. add them on LinkedIn whilst, yes. whilst you're there. You can 
either like you said research before you go and talk to them or after you've talked to them so that you don't forget who they are and they are on your radar moving forward and yeah um that's one of the beauties of networking because you you never know when you might need that person exactly and you never know how the how they could help you in the future um and even if it's just that they say they post about the fact that their company has a job going and you're looking for a job that's amazing or they may post about an opportunity or trying to look for someone it's a chance and if you do it enough that chance will eventually pay off just to finally ask you one question about uh, success in general what do you think you would say to any student who wants to be successful at university it doesn't have to relate to enterprise it can relate to anything that you'd like it to i think people's people measure success differently and i don't know if i don't know how trendy the listeners are i don't know how young or old the listeners are diverse (laughs) diverse the um gary vaynerchuk that or gary v as more people know him as on social media said it really well in something that i watched not too long ago and success is personal and success you should really think about yourself from your own viewpoint if you see success as earning lots of money or a certain amount of money and that's the way you're going to judge yourself on if you don't reach that amount of money then you're going to see it's going to be a failure so one was that a good thing to measure yourself by in the first place but two if you actually do reach that target goal do you honestly think you're going to be absolutely completely fulfilled in life or actually again was it not a good measure because now you're actually hungrier for some more money and so on so actually thinking about what you see as success is success you having a comfortable life in the future a healthy life in the future a life where you don't have to i think the trendy word is you don't have to grind every day to just about live you don't have to grind to do the things that make you happy It might be that success for you is working in the thing that you're passionate about. And I think for me, that is what if I could tell people how to measure themselves on success, I would say try and build it around something like that in that if you find the thing that you're passionate about first, the thing that you love doing the most, let's just say if that's computer gaming, taking it down to the basics, if it's computer gaming, um, that's your passion, even though you're studying law, then use your legal skills in the computer gaming industry so that you are doing something that you actually love day to day. Your, Your then success in your field is to work in the field that you love the most with the skills that you've got. And now that you're doing it day to day, you're going to be happy day to day because you are doing the thing you love. You don't want to end up studying one thing and ending up in a job that's not the thing that you're passionate about or not the thing you studied and having to grind every day just to live. You you want to do the things that you love. So focus on the things that you love and then build around that yeah. your success model. I think that's really well said, um, and I think it's so important, uh, especially the part about money and happiness and fulfilment. And I think doing something that makes you happy and something that makes you feel fulfilled, or that you're using the skills in the right way. And I agree with everything that you said. Uh, thank you so much for being interviewed uh, for the podcast, and thank you for your time as well. No, thank you for inviting me. It's great. There are lots to unpack from this episode all about enterprise as rather than just being one skill, enterprise is actually a set of skills for you to develop, some of which I've already talked about on this podcast, but others I'm going to talk about in later episodes, so do stay around to check those out. As per usual though, I have picked out some of the key takeaway points that I'm definitely going to try to incorporate into my own practice after having this interview with Oliver. So the first key point that I want to highlight from this episode is that Whilst enterprise skills can be associated and are really important to those who want to make their own business or run their own organisation, they're also useful for those who want to be employed within an organisation 
as an enterprising person can really make a difference within their organisation by spotting opportunities, being creative and coming up with new initiatives that will help that organisation to stand out and to perform to its best ability. So employers really are looking for those enterprise skills. The second key takeaway point from this episode is that whilst enterprising is a set of skills, Oliver did highlight that networking is one of the key skills from enterprise for you to aim to develop. My key point regarding networking is that networking through social media can be really, really effective. And actually, it's often undervalued. Both Oliver and I use LinkedIn to connect to others, to gain set of knowledge, and to find and take opportunities that others might miss. We use it to get our messages and voice out there. So I would recommend, if you aren't on LinkedIn, to get it and to start building connections. It's a free platform. You can have a paid version, but it is available for free. I'll link LinkedIn in the description of the YouTube version of this podcast that you can find on the Derby Uni Library YouTube channel. I'm definitely going to get back into posting on LinkedIn more, and so I really appreciate Oliver for reminding me of the true power of LinkedIn and social media networking. The final key takeaway point from this episode is that enterprise is developed through practice. You already have all the skills necessary to be enterprising. You just need to be critical in creating and finding an idea. You need to be creative in making the idea persuasive and making it stand out. You need to be bold in pursuing that idea and making it a reality. Boldness is a really important skill as you have to learn to get out of your comfort zone and to take the opportunities that come your way. In next week's episode, I am discussing all about how you can learn to be bold with the academic that actually inspired me to push myself out of my comfort zone, Sue Jennings. So that interview releases on Monday the 3rd of May 2021 at 12pm British Summertime. This episode was brought to you by the University of Derby Skills Team. Production, episode planning and editing was completed by Alexander Wood. Thanks to Stephen Plant for creating the amazing graphics and for balancing the audio of this episode. Thanks also go to Natalia Kodalavar, Tim Zalstra and Naomi Bowers-Joseph for giving feedback for this episode and the series on the whole. Thank you very much for listening.